风轻，大的山听。飞车发飞机一绝众生，金砖妙法轮教导我们如何了生脱死离苦得乐，纯真无生。Build the Shankha with great virtue, our love, compassion, for the sake of this assembly and all living beings. Please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us how to live suffering and attain bliss and end birth and death and quickly realize non birth. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambhutasa. Homage to the Blessed, Noble, and Perfectly Enlightened One. Namo Sadanto Suchetoye Allahati Sanmyao Sanputoche. Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa. Bai Chen Wan Jie Nan Zao Yi. 我今见闻得受持，愿解如来真实意。Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in a billion eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Namo, quelling disasters, lending life. Medicine Master Buddha Namo, quelling disasters, lending life. Medicine Master Buddha Namo, quelling disasters, lending life. Medicine Master. Buddha, Namo, quelling disasters, lending life, medicine master. Buddha, Namo, quelling disasters, lending life, medicine master. Buddha, Namo. Quelling disasters, <coughs> lending life, medicine master, Buddha Namo. Quelling disasters, lending life, medicine master, Buddha. Medicine master, does come one. Medicine master does come one. Medicine master does come one. Medicine master does come one. <coughs> Excuse me, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Venerable Master, and all, all good knowing advisors, Amitabha, welcome back. This is a uh, Sutra lecture number. Let me see, number one four five. And today, or this week, uh, this lecture, we get back to the sutra text. So we have spent a lot of time, um, because if I remember correctly, someone wanted to know about the different um, ways of rebirth, planes of existence. So we visited all the different kinds of beings. All the different planes of existence from the hells.、Um, we didn't complete it. Because there's a bit too much, but、uh, we covered maybe ninety percent of the different、uh, planes of rebirth, and <clears throat> most importantly,、uh, it gave us the opportunity to investigate loving kindness. Because loving kindness is the foundation of all Buddhist practices. Even people usually say generosity or giving, but even before giving comes loving kindness. And when you understand everything 
that you read or practice, you do in Buddhism through the lens of loving kindness, then it makes sense. Then it connects with the heart and, and um, you feel happier and you suffer less on a day-to-day -day basis. But without loving kindness, then um, Buddhism can be superstitious or it can be, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes it can be very harsh whereas um, people might value property or money uh, more than uh, people itself, which is uh, not definitely not Buddhist practice. Okay, so what do we have today? We are going to read part of the sutra, and this part contains the eight precepts, which we will uh, spend a bit of time looking at the eight precepts. And the sutra also mentions about people wanting to be reborn in the pure land. They hold the eight precepts and they want to be reborn in the pure land. And after we explain the sutra passages uh, and having a look at the eight precepts, we will look at <clears throat> someone who is known as the uh, Buddha's chief patron, foremost in, of all the Buddha's lay disciples. And his name is Anatta Pindika. Uh, we all have probably heard about him before. Okay, without further ado, uh, wait, before that, as usual, does anyone have any questions? I know Melinda has a question. So uh, when we come to the eight precepts, I'll ask Melinda to ask. But does anyone has, have any questions you want to bring up at this moment? No? If you want to type into the chat box, if that's easier, uh, please do so. Okay. Now, I'm going to put my palms together because we're reading the text. It says, Moreover, Manjushri, there may be those among the fourfold assembly of bhikkhus, bhikshu, bhikshus, excuse me, bhikshus, bhikshunis, upasakas, and upasikas, as well as other good men and women of pure faith who accept and uphold the eight precepts, either for one year or for three months, practicing and studying them. With these good roots, they may vow to be born in the western land of ultimate bliss where the Buddha of limitless life dwells, or in other words, Amitabha Buddha, to hear the proper Dharma, but their resolve may not be firm. <clears throat> so I'm going to run through this whole section of the uh, sutra text before we come back and explain. All right. However, if they hear the name of the world honored one, Medicine Master Vaidurya like Tathagata. Then, as the end of their lives draws near, before them will appear eight great Bodhisattvas whose names are Manjushri Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva who observes the sounds of the world, or Hello or Guanin Bodhisattva, Great Strength Bodhisattva, Inexhaustible Intention Bodhisattva, Jewel Udumbara Flower Bodhisattva, Medicine King Bodhisattva, Medicine Superior Bodhisattva, and Maitreya Bodhisattva. <clears throat> Those eight great Bodhisattvas will appear in space to show them the way and they will naturally be born by transformation in that land amid precious flowers of a myriad colors. Or they may be born in the heavens due to this cause. Although reborn in the heavens, their original good roots will not be exhausted and they will not fall into the evil destinies again. <clears throat> Excuse me. When their life in the heavens ends, they will be born among people again. They may be will turning kings, reigning over the four continents with awesome virtue and ease, bringing uncomfortable hundreds of thousands of living beings to abide in the practice of the ten good deeds. Or they may be born at Kastriyas, Brahmans, laymen, or sons of honorable families. They will be wealthy with storehouses filled to overflowing. Handsome in appearance, they will be surrounded by a great retinue of relatives. They will be intelligent and wise, courageous and valiant, like great and awesome knights. If a woman hears the name of the world honored one, medicine master Vaidura like Tathagata, and sincerely cherishes it, in the future, she will never again be born as a female. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. I'm going to quickly go back to... Oh, too much. Okay, excuse me, I just <clears throat> need to clear my throat. Excuse me. 
<clears throat> okay. All right. So this part of the sutra it says that there are people, okay, um, either monks, nuns, or the lay people, or other good men and women of pure faith who uphold the eight precepts. Okay, what are the eight precepts? Oh wait, hold on. Who uphold the eight precepts either for one year or for three months, practicing and studying them. I won't go um, in depth into the eight precepts right now in this slide because I have uh, in the next few slides will be about that. So I'll just explain the sutra tracks for now. The three months apparently are supposed to be the first faith and nine lunar months, which are also known as the months of purity. I think this is more of a Mahayana thing because um, in the Theravada sources, I have not been able to, um, as of now, find anything about this uh, three months. Uh, what it says is that the four heavenly kings during these three months, they come and inspect Jambu Vidpa or our continent. So people believe that the merit and virtue of um, that you get if you maintain the eight precepts well <clears throat> during these three months are greater than ordinary times. However, what I do know and what is reflected in both the Theravada and the Mahayana canons is that if you take the Bodhisattva precepts, okay, there are six days where you observe the um, the the uposatha or the uh, eight precepts. What are the eight days? They are on these are lunar dates. The eighth, the fourteenth, fifteenth, twenty third, twenty ninth, and thirtieth. And then let me see. Um, and if the month only has twenty nine days, then it should be on the twenty eighth and the twenty ninth instead of the twenty ninth and the thirtieth. So the last two days of the month. <clears throat> and Oh, hold on. Let me, just let me drink some water. Hold on. <clears throat> so, on certain days of this month, um, uh, the prince, the 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 sons of the four heavenly kings, they come down and they take a record of all the deeds done by humans of Jambu Vidpa. And then on half of those days, the four heavenly king comes down themselves. And so they do this twice a month. And then Lord Chakra, uh, or Lord Indra, Tikong, Jade Emperor, he comes down, um, I think on the 1st and the 15th, to also take a tally. So the spirits are always, from last week, we know there are spirits everywhere. So some of those spirits, their job is to observe and record down all the good and bad things that we do <clears throat> so we can't really escape sometimes we do things thinking you know no one can see but actually that's not true at all yeah okay so uh that, that's those other days so the next passage says we do with these good roots they may vow to be born in the western land of ultimate bliss that's the pure land where amitabha buddha dwells to hear the proper dharma but their resolve may not be firm okay so for some of you you may be wondering why is how can this happen what does resolve may not be firm resolve may not be firm means you haven't completely decided if you want to go that means you say or at least in the temple you come or you know you say or you wish to be reborn in the pure land but sometimes your actions suggest a different story okay that's what it means have not completely may not be firm or have not completely decided. <clears throat> so this is a reflection of the strength of a person's vows. It has less to do with, say, a wish that you want. It has more to do with the consistency in how you make certain decisions. What decisions? Well, the decision between, say, uh, listening to a lecture or meditating or reciting the sutra compared to watching a movie or going out for food or hanging out with your friends or going for fun like playing sports or whatever it is that you your hobbies are you know that's 
the that's where you find in yourself whether you belong in the category of your resolve may not be firm or your resolve is firm okay so when you practice well and you um uh, how do you say uh, have the opportunity to because in the next few slides that we read just now you can end up in heaven instead right okay let me see let me see hold on just give me a second let me see when is the best time for me to explain this do we i explain it now or do i explain it here i think i will explain it later all right so for now uh let me go back to this slide um i will come back and talk about this okay uh about this part for now all right when it says your resolve may not be firm that is not so much reflected in uh, what we want but in what we do and how we decide in what we do okay and then we'll, re we'll come back okay <clears throat> and so try it. however okay if they hear if you hear the name of the world honor one the world honor one means buddha and the name is medicine master vajira like tathagata which is medicine master buddha okay then at and at the end of our lives, we will get to see the eight great bodhisattvas. So here, 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 okay, hearing here, that's uh, less confused, confusing. When you talk about here as in hearing, it does not mean you just like now, I just mentioned Medicine Master Buddha's name and you hear it. It's, that's literally the, the meaning, but uh, because this is a sutra, the meaning is actually really deep. Here means you know what Medicine Master Buddha wants for you. The intent of Medicine Master Buddha. The intent of the sutra that we are studying right now. Hearing means to understand and to follow Medicine Master Buddha's wishes for all of us. It means to practice in the example of Medicine Master Buddha himself. He's here to show you the way. So if you have affinities with him, meaning you want to be like him or you want to be a Buddha like him, <clears throat> Shakyamuni Buddha gave us this sutra under Medicine Master Buddha's name to show us how we can emulate Medicine Master Buddha. So that means, that's what it means to hear. It's not just literally hearing his name, but to follow in his example. So this is more obvious. Hearing may be not so obvious. It's more obvious when they talk about seeing. You know, then they say you see the Buddha. And it's not mean you open your eyes and you see the, the image of the Buddha in front of you and then you bow. It's not seeing the Buddha image. It's do you recognize what the Buddha represents? The characteristics of the Buddha. The, so you'll get what I mean? So there's a saying in Chan. It says when you see no appearance, when you see nothing at all, that's when you see the Buddha. All right. So that's what it means when you see the Buddha, when you see nothing at all. So the eight bodhisattvas appear. Why? To remind you, to inspire you, okay, to uh, create the conditions for which the seeds that you have planted or the vows that you have planted that you want to be reborn in the pure land, they appear so that those seeds can uh, arise. So that when you see them, say, oh, okay, I remember now. Okay, because you, maybe Kuan Yin is your favorite Bodhisattva and you always want to be like Kuan Yin Bodhisattva and when she appears in front of you, say, oh, you, you just feel so full that, you know, your, you, you want to, you remember all your passwords and you just want to be like them. Okay, so then you will, follow them to the pure land and you will be born by transformation. Transformation birth uh, is considered a pure birth. If you get born in the heavens and above, um, your birth is uh, transformation based. It is immediate and you don't have, to, it's not the result of sexual desire and you don't have to go through either um, a womb or an egg or moisture, uh, nothing like that. Okay, so what happens if 
the bodhisattvas appear, or they may not appear, it depends, <coughs> and you don't follow them to the pure land, what's going to happen? Well, you get born in the heavens. Why? Because you have planted the, the good roots to be born in the heavens. Okay? So it says here, although reborn in the heavens, their original good roots will not be exhausted, so they will not fall into the evil destinies again. So if you read a sentence uh, properly, carefully, it suggests that it's otherwise it's saying that pe normally people who are reborn in their heavens, their good roots will get exhausted and they will fall into the evil destinies. And we have covered that before in, uh, I think it was class number 60 something, lecture number 60 something, that's a long time ago. So if you want to know more, you go visit that. But why in this case, it does not, that does not happen. If you hear the name of Medicine Master uh, uh, Buddha. Not only that does not happen, he says, when their life in the heaven ends, they will be born among people again. They may be will turning kings, reigning over the four continents with awesome virtue and ease, bringing uncountable hundreds of thousands of living beings to abide in the practice of the ten good deeds. What are will turning kings? Will turning kings are very special. Uh, individuals that appear very very rarely in the history of uh, the Buddhist cosmos and what they do is that they are able depending on their level okay they are able to unite the different uh, countries and not just the different countries but the continents as well okay for example when Shakyamuni Buddha was born he had the 32 hallmarks and when the sages and the Brahmin priests uh, inspected the prince, the baby, they make two predictions. They say that this person, this baby, will either be a world uniting, will turning king, or he will be a teacher of gods and humans. In other words, will become the Buddha. But there was one who a, a particular sage, I think his name was Ajita, as, as, as something starts with an A, and he was very definite. He was very sure. He said, he said this being will not choose to be a world turning king. He will definitely choose leaving home and will become a Buddha. So in terms of world turning kings, okay, before we come to the pure land thing, in terms of world turning king, there are four kinds, four levels of uh, world turning king okay first level is gold gold means uh, you are the top and you can unite not just the different countries of the of in this world that we can see which is which considered as the continent of Jambu Vipa but you, you uh, unite the four continents within uh, the, the Buddhist cosmos so there's one continent to the east, there's another continent to the west, there's another continent to the north, which leaves us in the continent of Jambu Vipa, which is in the south. The other three continents are not accessible to us. We cannot see them. We cannot uh, travel to them. We cannot see them until we have opened up certain spiritual abilities. Then we can fly to those continents. Okay, they're like in a different, different dimension. If you are silver level, okay, this is just like how uh, if you join airline um, loyalty programs, you know, they have different tiers, sometimes gold, silver, or emerald, or they use jewels, things like that. Okay, so for wheel turning king, you have gold, which is the highest. Then you have silver, the next level down. Silver can unite three continents, the south, the west, and the east. Okay, and then if you are copper level, which is the third, uh, second highest, no, third, level number three, okay. Copper level, uh, you only uh, can unite two continents or rule over two continents. And when you when they say a wheel turning king rules, they don't rule by force. So basically what happens is a wheel turning king is, is full of compassion and treats people really, really kindly. So when the, a will turning king appears in the world, other benevolent kings who, who lead their own countries, 
they realize that if they uh how you say if they if they willingly um fall under the rule or they give up their kingdom towards the will turning king it, it is for the betterment of everyone everyone will be very well treated so that's how a will turning king rules not through force but through loving kindness and compassion and fairness and then the last level the lowest level is called iron if you are iron level uh, uh will turning king then the only continent that you rule over is our continent that we know of jambu vipa this this uh, so called uh world all right okay let me see uh and then if you can do that if you become a will turning king you will naturally um inspire people to follow the 10 good deeds what are the 10 good deeds uh no no killing no stealing no engaging in sexual misconduct no lying no harsh speech no duplicitous speech that means double tongue you say one thing but uh you mean another thing um uh or how you say uh you gossip behind people's back uh you make people fight that's considered the same kind of speech and no frivolous speech that means you your speech matters uh you, when you have something proper to say you say it. you don't um, make unnecessary jokes or waste people's time you know asking stupid questions and all that okay and then not being greedy not being hateful and not being deluded so you can break it up into governing the com- the thank good deeds concern uh regulating the karma of the body the karma of the mouth and the karma of our thoughts or our, our mind okay all right so what does it mean when normally if people get born in the heavens their original good roots will be exhausted well a lot of people can get born in the heavens you don't have to be a buddhist to get born in the heavens all you need to do is be a very good person you help people you are generous for example you just practice the 10 good deeds and you do it well with respect and care for people those are the seeds that get you to be born in the heavens okay so what happens is that if you get born in the heavens life is extremely enjoyable there's so many nice things to do and all those things i mean in heaven you don't have to pay for it. you pay for your blessing so you don't know when you're using your blessing you just enjoy life you stroll in the gardens you pick flowers you make flower garlands you have food to eat depending on which heaven you are you still have sexual desire that you can fulfill and we have covered that in our uh, previous uh, classes so what happens is you end up just exhausting all your good roots you just exhaust all your blessings and if you don't pay attention to practice then when your life span ends and it will because there's each heaven uh, all the beings have their own life spans you still have to undergo birth and death and because you've exhausted your blessings and throughout so many previous lifetimes you have accumulated so many different kinds of karma the time will come where the conditions are right for you to fall and ha- have to undergo the karmic retribution of your past deeds good and bad so that you are still not in control okay so how okay uh, let me see um however okay if you practice the uh, noble eightfold path which is buddhist which is which is otherwise known as uh, buddhist practices then what happens is even if you end up in the heavens you still carry your habits of wanting to practice the dharma just like now all of you here listening and going to listen on youtube you do that because you have planted those habits in this life as well as from previous lives and now you are reaping the fruits of those karmic seeds that you have sowed same when you are born in the heavens if you have good habits wholesome habits in the dharma those 
karmic seeds will continue to arise. And when, because in the heavens, you can say, uh, go look for Maitreya Bodhisattva, our future Buddha, who is in the inner court of the Tushita heaven. And you can actually listen to the Dharma from the future Buddha. So that's why you, even if you fall and the, the, you end up, when you fall, I mean fall from the heaven, uh, you won't be an ordinary human being because you have continued to practice and accumulate merit and blessings um, uh, while you're still in the in the heaven. Okay, all right, just hold on. My notes, I don't know why my notes are all over the place today. Let me see. Um, or another way why you can be born in the heavens is because, like I said, mentioned just now, your resolve to be born in the pure land is not strong enough. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, say, um, uh, let me see, let, let me see where my notes are, sorry. Okay, let me go back to the other slide because my notes are there. Okay. So, how can someone's resolve may not be firm enough to be born in the pure land? Well, first to understand that, you have to understand the difference between the pure land and the heavens. All right. Heaven or the heavens is a place where there's immense enjoyment of the pleasures. And you just go and enjoy life. You kind of like how, say, if you are supremely rich in this world, okay, you are the top 1% of the entire population and you have all the money in the world to the extent that you can just spend and spend and spend without ever having to worry about money. And you have everything at your disposal. You can do anything you want. Money is not an object, you know. You can buy anything you want. You can buy any experience you want. Um, you can have everything done for you and you can just enjoy your life. Experience after experience after experience. The heaven is something like that, but a lot better to the extent that the best you can get in this world cannot even be compared to the worst that you will get in the first heaven, the lowest heaven that you can go to. That's how uh, different it is. Okay. All right. So that's the heaven. How about the pure land? The pure land is where you go to practice. So the pure land is very pleasant. Okay. But it's not about enjoying yourself. It's not about going there to enjoy your blessings. Okay, you're not going to the pure land to have a good or fun time. You're going to the pure land to learn the Dharma and to practice how to be a Bodhisattva. So there's learning, there's studying, there's meditation and there's application of yourself. But it's very pleasant. At the same time, the pure land is like, uh, like a heaven in terms of its, uh, how pleasant and comfortable it is. But the people there are not enjoying themselves like the like a normal deva or god or goddess in the heavens okay so to know whether you will end up in the pure land say you you are eligible okay you do the 10 good deeds very well you you have been practicing the eight precepts for very long okay for how long uh, what does the text say hold on let me see text um wait uh Oh, it's right in front of me. For one year or three months, eight precepts. That means you meditate. Okay, eight precepts doesn't mean just hold the precept. It means you meditate for eight years or three months. All right? So, the pure land, okay, is, uh, how you say, think of the pure land like CDTB, City of 10,000 Buddhas. It's a temple. It's a monastery. Okay? So, like I said before, if you have the opportunity to listen to a sutra lecture or meditate uh, or recite a mantra against, okay, your, your other choice is you have to decide between that or going out with your friends, 
going to a party, having fun, um, eating good food. How you make your decision in a long term basis will kind of determine how you instinct instinctively decide between the pure land or a heaven when that choice opens up in front of you. Okay, so for many people, getting to CDTB is a dream because why? Say if you are from Malaysia or you're from Asia, CDTB is very, very far away. It's all the way in, in the US, in California. If you are in the US already or you're already in California, think about, say, making a pilgrimage to the 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 Bodhisattva, the, the, there are four great Bodhisattva mountains in China, something like that, or making a pilgrimage to the where the Buddha was born. Okay, it's, it's not a fun trip, but it's a very meaningful trip. So for most people, okay, it can be a trip of a lifetime. And no, a normal person would say, okay, I will, I'm going for two weeks, I will spend one weekend at CDTB and the other uh, one and a half weeks I'll spend maybe going to Disneyland, going to California, uh, here the, the Yosemite Mount, uh, uh, National Park is very nice, I want to visit there maybe one weekend, you know. The person who gets to the, who would decide or who would get into the pure line is, the, is a person that says, oh, I've never been so far away before and this is my only chance to get to the United States to visit CDTB. I will spend my whole trip at CDTB and never even feel like they're missing out and not visiting any other place. That kind of mindset is the kind of mindset that gets you into the pure land. Because why? Because when the choice of being able to go to the heaven is right there, let me tell you, it will be very, very attractive, you know, and most people without thinking in a heartbeat will just choose heaven. So that's why it's not easy to get to the pure land. All right. Okay. All right. Let me go back to the text where we were. Uh, okay. Let me see. Did we read this already? Um, okay. Let me go to the next slide. Okay. We, all right. For now we will go to the, um, because we already read this, we'll go to the eight precepts. Okay because we are running out of time. Okay, the eight precepts, also known as the Pakwan Chai, or the eight fasting precepts, or the eight precepts, or the Uposata, or Uposata, let me see, both also I didn't pronounce very well, meaning to abide in a state of fasting or abstinence, and is commonly observed on the 8th, 14th, 15th, 23rd, 29th, and the 30th dates of the lunar calendar. Master. Yes, Melinda. Yeah. The lay Bodhisattva precepts uh, is fall under which one? Is it under number two, eight, and ten precepts? No, is there you see Bodhisattva precepts? It's under there. The one is not only meant for Buddha. Eh? Oh, no, no, no. These are, uh, are precepts for us, for human beings. So okay. the Bodhisattva precepts there are both. The two forms of Bodhisattva precepts, meaning the 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 two kinds of lay Bodhisattva precepts. Did, did that did, did I answer your question? Uh yes, yes. That means it's on the right hand side. The uh will attain this uh, Buddhahood, right? Yes. Okay. okay. So. Okay. So let me explain, okay, from then we go back to the slide before. This slide is about the purpose of the precepts. When we take the five precepts, we have to adjust the way we speak, the way we talk. We have to adjust the things that we do with our body and we have to adjust the way we think so that it uh, conforms to the five precepts. When we do that, we are creating the conditions for future rebirth as human uh, human beings. So you could say that the five precepts uh, represent what a decent human being is like. 
the better you hold the five precepts, the more you understand the meaning or the spirit behind the five precepts, the better human being you will be. Okay? And that's the minimum you want. Five precepts is the minimum. Okay? What do I mean by the more you understand the precepts? Uh, I've mentioned this before, so I'll just mention this very brief, briefly. Most people, when they take the five precepts, it's very, um, how you say, because, why? Because I don't want to fall into the hells. And they look at the precepts from a very selfish point of view. It's only for themselves. So when, for example, when I was in uh, college uh, and in work, when I held the five precepts and people asked me why I held the five precepts, it was very, very hard for me to explain in a way that they understood. I just say, I cannot lie. Uh, it's about my own um, virtue. And they just, okay, okay, you're doing it for yourself, for your own benefit. All right. But that's not what the five precepts are. The five precepts are actually a lot deeper than that because the five precepts represent us at our best. For example, the people that you really care for in your life, as they go about through life, you want them to be always surrounded by people who will never lie to them, who will never cheat them, who will never harm them physically, you know, who will never uh, who their partners or their yeah you never want them to have partners who will cheat on them and if you go through the precepts one by one you always want everyone you care about your parents your children your siblings your grandparents the people who are important to you to always be surrounded by people who maintain the five precepts so everywhere they go they feel safe they don't have to second guess what people are telling them they don't have to worry about their well-being you know and they don't ha you don't have to worry about them being cheated and all those things right okay then you because you are close to them by right whenever you talk to them whenever you deal with them you should always be based on the five precepts so the five precepts uh, show you at your best for the people that you care for. So by right, you know, if you look at the five precepts this way, people who get married, they should take the five precepts. Why? Because it's the decent thing to do for your husband or for your wife. When you have children, you should take the five precepts. Why? Because, you know, you, that's how you should treat uh, your children, right? But to be a Buddhist is not easy because when you take the five precepts, then you have to treat everyone the same way. But the, uh, the what's the word I'm looking for? The, the benefit to that in treating everyone the same way is, okay, for as, I'll use this example, my grandmother, when she was alive last time, I really love my grandmother both my grandmothers. So whatever they do, I would happily, although I was young at that time, I would happily smile. They, it was very hard for them to make me upset. They always brought out the best in me because I wanted them to be proud of me. If I can treat all elderly women that I see in my life the same way, that how I treat my grand, uh, grandmothers, I never knew my grandfathers. I never had the opportunity to, to meet them, but I had grandmothers. So all those elderly women that I meet and I treat them like my grandmother, it means that they it's very, very hard for me to get upset with them, right? So that's the upside. If we can learn to apply the five precepts to everyone, but in a way from, from a perspective of caring, for their benefit. When we do that, we, our lives get better. But the trick is trying to learn how. So bodhisattvas, okay, how they can become bodhisattvas is because that's exactly what they do. They treat everyone like their relative, like their love, uh, dearly loved ones. Okay, so that's the five precepts. Then when you take the eight and 10 precepts, you're creating the conditions for heavenly rebirth, and this is not just heavenly rebirth in the desire heavens, it's actually more of the higher heavens, the ones that you get to 
through higher states of mind, through loving kindness and dhyana. Uh, these are the eight and ten precepts. And then when you hold the bhikshu or the bhikshuni precepts, you are creating the conditions to end birth and death. Okay, uh, that's the bhikshu or bhikshuni precepts. And then finally, we have the bodhisattva precepts. The bodhisattva precepts are meant to give you a taste of how a bodhisattva behaves. And if you do it well enough, you end up as a Buddha, finally. That's because that's what uh, all bodhisattvas uh, end up as, as a Buddha. So the bodhisattva precept is meant to show you how a bodhisattva will react in certain situations. Okay, so now we go back to our slide. So it's all still based on cause and effect. Okay, everything in the Dharma is all based on cause and effect. Why? Because we are in a conditioned world. All right, so nothing is not magic. It doesn't, nothing uh, happens without um, causality. Okay, so going back here. What are the eight precepts? No killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lying, no intoxicants. Those are the five precepts. And you add on no high or luxurious or large bait. No makeup, perfume, entertainment, singing, dancing. And number eight, no eating at improper times, which is not eating after uh, lunchtime. Okay. Actually, number three, under eight precepts, I think I have, I have made a mistake. It's not no sexual misconduct. It is no sexual conduct. It means no sexual conduct at all. Okay. So number three is no sexual conduct. All right. So what does this mean? Okay. So we've gone through this, the purpose of the five precepts. The five precepts restrain and prevent unwholesome actions and results of our karma. It creates the conditions for future human rebirth. The actions that it regulates are those that cause pain and suffering. Okay, so it regulates one's thoughts, actions and speech and it acts as a mirror towards mindfulness of one's intention or self-awareness. So when you hold the precepts, you're more aware of the things that you're doing or saying or thinking so it's kind of like a mirror and now we know it's not just for your own benefit but you actually hold it because the five precepts really come into spirit when um, um, when you deal with people that's where the five uh, five precepts come alive when you're sitting in the cave all you, you just have to be aware of your thoughts but when you're dealing with people is your thoughts translated into your actions and your speech so then you realize the five precepts are also for the people around you. You want them to feel safe around you. You want them to be able to trust you. Okay, you don't want to leave, uh, uh, how you say, disappoint people. Okay, now, eight precepts. Slightly different. Okay, it is ethical, yes, but it's also spiritual. It serves as a foundation for higher states of realization or wisdom. And how do you get these higher states? Well, the eight precepts are meant to create the conditions that are conducive for meditation. So it's not just holding the eight precepts. You're supposed to do something when you hold the eight precepts, which is what? Meditate. Okay. The eight precepts are also meant for lay people who have very busy commitments and, life and uh, responsibilities to experience the opportunities of monastic life. Okay, that's, the, that's one big purpose of the eight precepts. And the eight precepts are also about the practice of right intention, which is renunciation, goodwill, and harmlessness. Okay, so for a long time, when I first learned about Buddhism, and from the first time I took the eight precepts until I became a monk at CDTB, the way the eight precepts have been explained is very literal. It is very to the spirit, to the to the letter, not to the spirit. So no entertainment. Sometimes some people will say they even in the house, they don't allow people to play any music. Why? Because they themselves can't listen to music. So that's how they hold the eight precepts. I have been asked a question, said I have to cook dinner for my family, but 
the where I do my grocery shopping, they play music over the speakers. What can I do? Should I not go shopping for my family because I can't listen to music? So the eight precepts become really rigid. So they avoid shopping centers, no grocery shopping. Sometimes um, the no sleeping on a high or luxurious bed. I've heard advice being given to people to buy a new bed. Go buy a very short bed. Most of, first of all, I don't think short beds have been sold, right? I don't think it's normal to walk into a furniture shop and 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 find a very short bed, you know. Um, so that happens. And then uh, people have told me when they hold the eight precepts, what they do is they sleep very early. Why? Because there's nothing to do. So if you hold the precepts like that, you could say, yeah, you are holding the precepts. Uh, you, yeah, you are holding the precepts. I mean, literally you are holding the precepts, but it's not going to lead to any wisdom because you know, you're just going to lead to a very, you're just going to have a very boring time. You can't do anything. You can't use your phone to look at whatever it is you use your phone for. You can't read newspaper. You don't listen. You can't watch movies. You can't listen to music. You know, what else is there to do? You just sit there feeling bored, right? And does that also mean that if you, some people are beggars or they have a very, um, they're very unfortunate and they sleep on the ground they may not have enough food to eat at night they may not eat anything and if they are wor they are virtuous by nature that means they follow the five precepts already they don't adorn themselves you know they don't have jewelry they don't smell good they don't put on makeup does that mean that they are also observing the eight precepts and they get the benefits because they are doing the exact same thing if if the eight precepts mean doing those things does that also mean that some beggars are fulfilling the eight precepts? Actually, some of them are even more ascetic than most lay people when they hold the eight precepts. So does that mean they get more benefits? So, like I said earlier, the eight precepts are only meant to create the right conditions for uh, someone to either meditate, recite the Buddha's name, um, recite the sutras, whatever it is that you withdraw from your senses. Okay, normal activity is you follow after your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. That means your eyes see nice things. You want to go out and see nice things, watch a movie, uh, scroll on your phone. You know, uh, you want to hear nice things, music pleasant sounds, you know, normal activities all revolve around sensual pleasures. But when it comes to the eight precepts, for example, like no sleeping on a high and comfortable bed, is to remind you how much of our daily lives revolves around seeking comfort. We always seek comfort. Like now, as we are all sitting or standing wherever it is in your position as you are listening, observe yourself and see how often you adjust your position. The moment you sense any discomfort in your body, you automatically adjust to try to remove the discomfort. So it, that's automatic in life. When we stand, we, we, we move. We cannot, it is very, very hard to sit still all the time. But when it's time to meditate, you can't move all the time. Why? Because your movement will prevent you from entering samadhi or dhyana, right? So the eight precepts are meant to remind you, okay, for, just for now, just for today, just only this 24 hours, just bear with discomfort. See how um, it feels like, because you're always running away from discomfort or discover if you can concentrate until you forget that you are uncomfortable. You know, discover your potential. Find out something about yourself that otherwise, if you didn't take the eight precepts, you will never know, right? So that's what the eight precepts are meant to do. Okay, going back to the eight precepts. 
uh, okay so the first five are very self-explanatory okay so no high and luxurious large bed can be taken literally uh, we should but the spirit of it is to bear with discomfort as you're sitting down on your meditation cushion it's been 10 minutes it's been 20 minutes it's been 30 minutes and suddenly you know you feel a lot of pain or discomfort and you have an urge to move use this very rare opportunity to go deeper into your mind and find out more about yourself maybe if you have a bit of patience and you concentrate your mind in a different way you could forget about the pain for example there's a thai monk who uh, had a lot of skill in meditation he didn't trust um, the uh, anesthetics that you get when you go under an operation so he had a kidney operation performed on him and without any anesthetic all he did was he went into meditation and he entered a state where he could feel the pain but the pain did not bother, bother him isn't that kind of skill useful right but you never know if you move you will never discover that part of you if you're always moving always seeking after comfort all right so no makeup, perfume, entertainment, song and dance. You can take it literally and you should, but the spirit of it is your senses. There's desire behind it, okay, wanting to look good and all that, but it's also your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and that you should withdraw rather than glorify them. Okay, and then no eating at improper times means, you know, if you eat, it's very hard to meditate. It's not easy to meditate on a full stomach and it's also about renunciation about giving up okay and also if you eat less your energy flows better yeah your chi uh, but you have to try to figure that out for yourself all right okay so let me see um maybe i will skip this because uh we don't need this uh I will just talk about what Bodhidharma says. Okay, Bodhidharma says fasting. This fasting you can apply to the eight fasting precepts. Okay, the eight precepts says fasting is useless unless you understand what this really means. To fast means to regulate, to regulate your body and mind so that they are not distracted or disturbed. And to observe means to uphold, to uphold the rules of discipline according to the Dharma. Fasting means guarding against the six extractions on the outside and the three poisons on the inside and striving through contemplation to purify your body and mind six extractions attractions on the outside means the six sensual sense objects that has to do with our six senses or the eyes ears nose tongue body and mind all right three poisons on the inside means our greed ignorance and um and uh, hatred or animosity all right then, Bodhidharma says, fasting also includes five kinds of food. But he's not talking about normal food. Okay, He says, first, there's delight in the Dharma. This is the delight that comes from acting in accordance with the Dharma. Second is harmony in meditation. This is the harmony of body and mind that comes from seeing through subject and object. Third is invocation, the invocation of Buddhas with both your mouth and your mind. This, in other words, this is mindfulness of the Buddha. Okay, you're emulating the qualities of the Buddha. Fourth is resu resolution, the resolution to pursue virtue, whether walking, standing, sitting, or lying down. So when you observe the eight precepts, no matter what you're doing, your deportment, okay, whether you're walking, sit, standing, sitting, or lying down, your mind should always be observing the eight precepts. Okay, and then fifth is liberation, the liberation of your mind from worldly contamination that means the sensual objects again what are you thinking of are you thinking of when the the next day you're going to eat a lot of food because you miss dinner you know that uh, that's known as worldly contamination so what he says he says these five are the foods of fasting unless a person eats these five pure foods it is wrong to think he's fasting also, once you stop eating the food of delusion, if you touch it again, you break your fast. And once you break it, you reap 
no blessing from it. The world is full of deluded people who don't see this. Who are these people? People who take the eight precepts literally. They indulge their body and mind in all manner of evil. They give free rein to their passions and have no shame. And when they stop eating ordinary food, they call it fasting. How absurd. So he's trying to point to the spirit of the precepts rather than to the letter of the precepts. Okay. All right. So Melinda's question is, Melinda, if, I'm, if I have it wrong, please let me know. Your question is about how you can hold the eight precepts on certain days, for example, like the Buddha's birthday, and um, whether you can just do it by yourself, right? Uh, yes, Pastor. Okay. Because traditionally, if you want to take the eight precepts, you come to the temple, and if there's a fahoi going on, there's a session going on on the first day, they will transmit the eight precepts for either one day and one night, or you... It's up to the individual. They want to take two, three, four, five days or the whole session. They can choose to do that. Okay. So how do you, let's say you're at home and you want to observe the eight precepts and you are interested in going through a, uh, kind, not a ceremony, but a series of, it's like a ritual so that mentally and physically you can prepare yourself or do it in the right way okay first use your imagination okay you imagine that whoever it is you want to request the precepts from it could be shufu it could be the buddha okay amitabha buddha or shakyamuni buddha or the buddhas or the 10 directions you imagine that they're right there in front of you that's the first, okay? Second, you imagine that they're very happy to know that you want to observe the precepts. Okay, that they're very happy, they're full of joy, and they're very proud of you because you want to observe the eight precepts. Not just you want to observe the eight precepts, now you understand what the eight precepts really mean. So you're not just stupidly follow the eight precepts, but you, you use the eight precepts to create the right conditions for your own practice. So that's why they're happy, because you understand the spirit of the eight precepts. You're not a beginner, okay? You're no longer a novice. And then, okay, the next thing you imagine is that the precepts, wanting to undertake the precepts is not a promise that you're going to make to the Buddha. You don't promise the Buddha or want to observe the eight precepts well. No. The promise that you make is to yourself or to be more accurate it is a promise that you make to your self nature to your buddha nature to your potential for awakening and the buddha is just there to certify your promise to your buddha nature you got that this is just like when you bow to the buddha okay people who don't understand they bow they are buying to an outside buddha but then if Bodhidharma is your shufu Bodhidharma or school, you say, stupid, no, 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 don't be deluded. The Buddha represents wisdom. The Buddha is there to show you the way. The Buddha represents your Buddha nature for awakening. So when you bow to the Buddha, you are bowing to your own Buddha nature. That's what all your practice is about, to uncover your own self nature. Okay? So same, when you make the vow, you want to undertake the eight precepts, you are inviting the Buddha there to just certify or witness your promise to your own self-nature. Okay, because why? In the end, who benefits is yourself. Even if you promise the Buddha, he's not going to benefit. You promise other people, they're not going to benefit. You are going to benefit. All right? Okay. Then you bow to the Buddha because when the Buddha is in front of you, what you want to do is you want to bow. Right? And because if you can imagine well that the Buddha is in front of you, your bowing will be sincere. Then, you state your intention in receiving the precepts, why you want to hold the precepts. In other words, this is your body resolve. This is your motivation. Okay? This is also your vows. This is where you set your intention. All right? After that, okay, you do repentance. But this repentance is not like tapetan where you, you do the entire ceremony. No. What this repentance means is a recognition or an understanding 
that the reason we are still not awakened yet, the reason why we are still unenlightened and have to undergo suffering is because out of ignorance, what is ignorance? We don't remember, we don't understand, we don't even know when we do it. We create unwholesome karma. And so in our present life and future lives, we have a lot of unresolved, unwholesome karma waiting and we don't even know where it comes from. Okay, we know it comes from ourselves, but we don't remember. We, you know, we don't even know when it happens. You know, we don't know anything at all. So if we don't do something about it, our rebirth is going to continue to be endless. And with every rebirth and every moment of time when the conditions are right, so will be the opportunities for our suffering. So because of that, we can recognize in ourselves this ignorance. There should be some fear, you know, because we don't, you know, and disgust at ourselves, our, our past behavior. So the repentance is to get over it, is to heal ourselves from our past transgressions and to want to start anew from now on. We want to start anew and how we can start anew by observing the five and eight precepts. That's how we can start. So there's a repentance verse that says, For all the evil deeds I have done in the past, based on beginningless greed, anger, and delusion, and created by body, speech, and mind, now before the Buddhas, I repent of them all. That's the first verse. Second verse is the same, except I repent of them all. It says, I repent of all my offenses. And the third time you, you, you repeat this verse, says, for all the evil deeds I've done in the past based on beginningless greed, anger, and delusion and created by body, speech, and mind, before the Buddhas, I repent of the source of my offenses, which is your deluded mind. Okay? So now you are imagining the Buddha is in front of you, witnessing your uh, vow to take the eight precepts. You are about to the Buddha. You have stated your vow, so your intention or your body resolve in why you want to take the precepts. You have gone through your repentance. Okay. The next is you recite the three refuges. Okay. Which is you say, me or I, my Dharma name, I take refuge with the Buddha, I take refuge with the Dharma, I take refuge with the Sangha. For one day and one night or however long you want, I vow to be an Upasaka or Upasika, that means a lay person or a, a lay person, a lay man or a lay woman of pure conduct. Then you say it three times. Okay, that is uh, to recite the three refuges. And then next is where you recite the eight precepts. And how you recite the eight precepts, the formula is kind of, as all Buddhas refrain from killing for, for their entire lives, I vow to uphold this precept and refrain from killing for one day and one night. So you just uh, uh, recite it eight times for the eight different uh, precepts. And then after that, you bow in gratitude to the Buddha and you begin holding the precepts like that. Okay. And once the 24 hours is up, then coming back to your vows and your intentions, that's where you transfer the merit based on your vows and your intention. So if you had, your vow was to be re, to hold the eight precepts so you can be reborn in a pure land, like how we just read in the Medicine Master Buddha Sutra, and you say, okay, I transfer the merit to the pure land, to my lotus flower in the pure land for my birth by transformation. So when you die, instead of choosing to go to Disneyland, or go out for dinner with friends or watch a movie, he will say, no, I planted this vow before, I'm going to follow my vow, I'm going to go to the pure land instead. Okay? All right. So if any of you want a step-by-step -step guide on how you can do it at home, uh, let me know and I will type it out and I can share it with people. All right? Okay, time up. Questions? Uh, Why Dhamma Master, I've got one. Yes, Yuling. Yes, please. Do you, does the eight precepts, uh, when one takes the eight precepts, does it have to be uh, done formally in a temple? 
and uh, transmitted by a Dharma master. Or oh, not necessarily. Okay. okay, so that was, you know, the last 20 minutes I've been talking about that, Sri Lang. <laughs> so that was Melinda's question, as in if you want to do it at home and you're not in the temple, or the temple is not, because uh, it's not as if you can just walk in the temple and get it done. Uh, ah, yes, you, yes. Yeah. Yes, so, that's what I, I mean. Yes. So what I have been explaining uh, is how you can do it yourself. All those that I've been talking about just now is how you can do it yourself at home. Yeah. So, so that means it does not have to be formally transmitted by a Dharma master. Yes, because the eight precepts, unless you say stay in a temple full time, you know, the eight precepts are short term. They are only taken for however long you want to take them. Yeah, temporary. Yeah. Okay. My 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 second question is, um, to be born in the pure land, to the born in to be born in Amitabha Buddha's pure land, as stated in the Medicine Master Sutra, um, if you chant the Medicine Master Sutra, and that means you can also be born in the pure land if you vow to be born in the pure land. Correct? Is is that what it means? Yes, uh, basically most Buddhists, it, it does not really depend on the practice. It re get, if you want to get beyond, born in the pure land, it depends on your intention. So you could recite uh, the Tape, Tape Chou, the Great Compassion Mantra. You can recite the Leng Yan Chou, which is the Shurangama Mantra. You could recite the Buddha's name. You could recite the Lotus Sutra. You know, you could bow. You can meditate. It is your intention that decides that decides for you what you want. Because practice different what people. What if one aspires? Uh, okay, what if one aspires to be born in the east, uh, the eastern land of Medicine Master Vaiduria Tathagata? So, what would how would that be? You want to aspire to be born in the Eastern Pure Land. Okay, so traditionally, uh, say if someone wants to be born in Amitabha's Pure Land, they recite Amitabha Buddha's name. Why? Because it's easier. It's easier to remind yourself. And someone who wants to be born in Medicine Master Buddha's Pure Land will probably recite his mantra or you can recite his name as well. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can recite Medicine Master Buddha's name, but in your heart you want to be born, reborn in Amitabha Buddha's pure land. You can do that as well, because it's your intention, not so much the practice. The practice is there to back up your intention. What if you chant Amitabha Buddha's name, but you do not mind be born in the Eastern pure land too? Yeah, you is totally fine. Is that's why I say it's entirely up to your intention, your vows, what you want. The practice doesn't dictate what you want. It's what you want that gets you what you want. The practice is to fulfill that, that the cause and effect part. Okay. Thank you, Dhamma Master. Uh, so you can recite Tape Cho, you can recite Leng Yen Cho, you can recite Om Bani Pat Mi Hom, you can count your breathing, you can practice Hua To, sitting in Chan. You can do anyone and you can still have the intention of wanting to be born in the Pure Land or wanting to be born in uh, uh, the Eastern Pure Land or the Western Pure Land or want to get to a particular heaven like the Tushita heaven where Maitreya Bodhisattva is. You can do that as well. You know, uh, it's up to you. Like there's the story where the deva from the heaven, she died, came back to earth. She could remember her past life in the heaven. And every day she did good deeds and with the vow to re re reborn back in the heaven to so that she can uh, reunite with her heaven husband. After a hundred years, she died. She was reborn back in the heaven, you know. But because heaven time is so slow, they, it was still the same morning which she died, although in human years, it was 100 years already. Then the husband said, oh, I didn't see you all morning. Where do you go? 
<laughs> she said, oh, I was picking flowers for you and I had died. So I was born in the human realm for 100 years. I did a lot of good deeds and I transferred the merit. Or I made the vow or my intention all means the same thing to be reborn back to as your wife. And that indeed that happened, you know, so is the intention. Okay. The practice is just there to fulfill the meritorious, meritorious part of it. The intention will help direct you to where you want to go. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Anyone? No. Okay. Then we shall end today's lecture here and transfer merit. Okay. Okay, may every living being, our minds as one and radiant with light, share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity, may our minds awake to great compassion, wisdom and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave our grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of our endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Okay, let's do three bows to the Buddha. Okay. First bow, second bow, third bow, half bow. Bowing respect to the Rebel Master. Second bow, third bow, half bow. Okay, everyone, Amit of all. Um, it was good to have all you all here today, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you.